In this segment of the, on the endocrine system, we're going to be focusing on the adrenal glands and the hormones that are synthesized and secreted from that gland. And so first, let's take a look at the adrenal gland and look at the two regions of the adrenal gland. So within the adrenal gland, we have two regions. There's the adrenal cortex and there's the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal cortex is the outermost part of the adrenal gland, whereas the adrenal medulla is the innermost part. Now remember that the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. So this is the hat for the kidney. So the kidney is wearing a hat. So let's focus on the adrenal cortex, that outermost layer of the adrenal gland. The adrenal cortex is divided into three layers. There is the zona glomerulosa, which is the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex. There's the zona fasciculata, which is the middle layer of the adrenal cortex. And there is the zona reticularis, which is the innermost region of the adrenal cortex. The medulla has no additional layers. So let's focus on the hormones that are synthesized and secreted by the adrenal cortex. This is a class of hormones called adrenocorticoids. All of the adrenal corticoids are steroid hormones. The zona glomerulosa secretes a class of adrenocorticoids called mineral corticoids. For example, aldosterone is a mineral corticoid secreted from the zona glomerulosa. When aldosterone is synthesized and secreted, it will target the kidneys. And when it targets the kidneys, it tells the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and to excrete potassium. The other two layers of the adrenal cortex, the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis, are also very important. Let's focus on the zona fasciculata. The zona fasciculata primarily secretes a class of adrenocorticoids called glucocorticoids. An example of a glucocorticoid is cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone that you will be learning about in lab. Be sure to watch the video lecture on cortisol feedback and function. The zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex primarily secretes sex hormones. So these are called androgens. So let's think about how we could control the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone is not controlled by the hypothalamus, hypophysiotropic, and pituitary glantropic hormones. In other words, aldosterone does not have a feedback loop like you've seen with cortisol or thyroid hormone or growth hormone or testosterone. So we need to start thinking about, well, how do we control the release of aldosterone if it's not controlled or regulated via the hypothalamus or the hypophysio, hypophysial pituitary system? or hypophysial portal system. Okay, so let's think about the normal function of aldosterone. We said the function for aldosterone was to target the kidneys, to tell the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and to excrete potassium. So the question is, or why would aldosterone tell the kidneys to reabsorb sodium? Let's look at the plasma. So here's our bloodstream, and this is the plasma. If our plasma levels of sodium get low, and I have high potassium, aldosterone is very important in regulating these ion concentrations. So aldosterone release then would occur, and when aldosterone releases occur, occurs, the kidneys will reabsorb sodium, and when the kidneys reabsorb sodium, our plasma level in of sodium will go back up to normal. And when aldosterone targets the kidneys to excrete potassium, now our potassium level is going to drop in the plasma as well. And so we're maintaining our sodium and our potassium ion levels in the blood. So to turn this system off, once sodium and potassium are back at their normal levels, negative feedback functions and tells aldosterone to stop being secreted. Now the adrenal medulla is also very important within the endocrine system. The adrenal medulla contains secretory cells called chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells secrete epinephrine, 
norepinephrine, and dopamine. Since the adrenal medulla secretes primarily epinephrine, this will be our focus when we speak of the adrenal medulla. We will focus on epinephrine. So this is under neural control. So it's the nervous system that's causing synthesis and secretion of adrenal medulla hormones or stopping synthesis and secretion of adrenal hormones. So let's focus on epinephrine. So we release epinephrine, or if you, you remember epinephrine is also called adrenaline, you release epinephrine in a fight or flight response. So let's assume that you are running from a mugger. If you're running from a mugger, it would be nice to have an increased plasma glucose concentration so you could use that glucose to generate energy. So when epinephrine is released during these fight or flight responses, it's going to cause gluconeogenesis as well as glycogenolysis. So when glycogenolysis occurs, what two organs are targeted by epinephrine? So if you recall, glycogenolysis means we're breaking down glycogen into glucose. And the two organs that store glycogen are the liver and the skeletal muscle. When gluconeogenesis occurs, epinephrine is targeting what organs? If you recall, in gluconeogenesis, we are producing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So for example, we can produce glucose via glycerol and even amino acids. So the liver is very important in gluconeogenesis. Both of these, gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, are going to increase the blood glucose levels so that you can use that glucose toward energy when you're running from your mugger. So if the liver is undergoing gluconeogenesis, it needs a substrate to do that. So remember I said for gluconeogenesis, we could do this by using glycerol and amino acids. Now, to get amino acids, you would have to break down protein. So would you want to break down muscle when you're running from a mugger? Hopefully you answered no. So we would not want to use amino acids and convert amino acids into glucose. We could, however, use Glycerol. And so where does glycerol come from? Glycerol comes from a lipolysis reaction. So in lipolysis, we take our triglyceride and we break it down into fatty acids and glycerol. So once we have that glycerol, it can go into the liver and be converted to glucose. So epinephrine not only causes gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, if gluconeogenesis is going to occur, lipolysis has to occur. So when lipolysis occurs, you need to remember what's going to happen to those fatty acids. Those fatty acids can also go into the liver, causing ketogenesis. So both ketogenesis, lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, and glycogenolysis are all caused by epinephrine.